On the last day of the Philadelphia Convention, you may have heard me mention this in previous episodes, especially if you're not new here, Benjamin Franklin prepared a speech where he said he approved of ratification of the Constitution. This is September 17th, 1787. We call it Constitution Day. He said he approves of it with all its faults, but he expected it still to end in despotism. Those were his terms. He said this will end in despotism as all other forms, and I'm paraphrasing the rest, had done prior for it. It was a pretty amazing prediction that really has struck me more and more in recent years, but the Constitution itself wasn't his first rodeo. So on this episode, I'm going to introduce you to the first proposal. Maybe there was another one that I'm missing, but really the first major proposal for the Articles of Confederation, which was presented to the Second Continental Congress by Benjamin Franklin in 1775, almost a full year before they even declared independence and almost a full year before they had the first draft from John Dickinson for what became the Articles of Confederation later on. And if you really want to understand the original legal meaning of the Constitution, you have to understand at least a little history behind its precursors. So I'm going to cover all that and more in just a moment. But first of all, a quick hello and a huge thank you to everyone joining me here today, whether you're watching live or in the archive. I can't thank you enough for spending some of your time with me today. And while we allow people another moment or so to get notifications to join us on the live stream, uh, let's check out uh, the live chat here. There's Haji over in uh, Southeast Michigan. Good to see you, buddy. Dixie Strong in Bama. President Merkin Muffley. I love that. In Northeast Indiana, Lawrence Smith. Says hello, Michael B. and TAC. Appreciate you being here. Poet Fisherman, appreciate you as well. I appreciate everybody. From Iowa, Cheriton Farm in Missouri, Israel and Colorado. Senator DT, been a while, in Elkhart, Indiana. Irwin Havernick in Omaha, good to see you as well. Clay Kent, Murray Ray, Stephen Potts. Missouri is in the house. Man, I love it. <laughs> you know, that's pretty cool. Missouri does represent pretty strong here on this show, and I'm so grateful for you guys. Uh, Christine Mayer in Colorado, Samuel Adams, Dale, Cole Cochran, Brian in Georgia, Joe Vasquez, and everyone else. I can't thank you enough, and I will look through the chat a little bit later in the show if I can get through this quickly enough. Otherwise, I will read through some comments and questions later on today and tomorrow. I reply to a small handful of them, but I get a ton of ideas for future episodes based on questions or people challenging me on such and such. And then I do a follow-up at some point. So I really appreciate you guys uh, sending all your feedback. And of course, the comments help trigger the algorithm and tells the platform to show the pe program to more people. Joe Vasquez, Sharon Patriot, and everyone else, thank you for being here. So let's start this out from an article that we published last week, Friday. It was an anniversary of Benjamin Franklin's introducing his plan for confederation. And he said this is a June 21st we published last weekend or last, I guess, Thursday. On this date in 1775, Mike Meharry writes, Benjamin Franklin introduced in the Second Continental Congress a formal plan for confederation of the American colonies. Franklin introduced his plan, the Articles of Confederation and Perpetual Union, Nearly a year before Congress began formally working on the Articles of Confederation, of course, and the Declaration of Independence. And if you think of the timing here, this is just a few short months after Lexington and Concord and the shot heard around the world. So the timing's pretty intense. Although Congress tabled Franklin's plan, and I think it was actually Franklin who called for that himself, it influenced the development of the Articles as well as the Constitution. Just a little background that I think is pretty interesting from Smithsonian Magazine. I will link to all of these things that I'm talking about here in the show notes over at tenthamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. There you're going to find all of our archives, all the different platforms are on, and individual blog posts for every episode where I link to stuff that I reference so you can read in context and learn more on your own time. But here from Smithsonian, mind you, Franklin had spent Almost, a lot of people tell you 20 years. It was the vast majority of the previous 18 years in London and throughout Europe. And he had only returned on May 5th, 1775. I think he left, oh yeah, on the night of April 1875. He was in mid-ocean. Now, if you think of the timing of that as well, when it comes to Lexington and Concord, it makes it very interesting. But they say when Franklin landed in Philadelphia with his grandson on May 5th, Delegates of the Second Continental Congress were beginning to gather there. 
Franklin was selected as a member of the Congress the day after his arrival. Mind you, he was the most famous, the first American is what they called him. He's the most famous American in Europe. He developed a great deal of fame with the Patriots for arguing against the Stamp Act while he was over there. And so he was he was been doing this for a long time. Nearing 70, they said, he was by far the oldest in the Second Continental Congress. And the same thing happened during the ratification or the uh, uh, Philadelphia Convention as well. Most of the 62 others who convened in the Philadelphia or the Pennsylvania State House, such as Thomas Jefferson and Patrick Henry for, from Virginia and John Adams and John Hancock from Massachusetts, had not even been born when Franklin first went to work there more than 40 years earlier. So he was very well known. He was a very intelligent guy, but he was kind of keeping quiet. Mind you, he'd been gone. He had been doing things, advocating for, you know, the good guys. But then he took some interesting strategic choices where people were kind of questioning. Uh, he was expected to be a patriot, but he was quiet. He just kept it quiet. And from my understanding, at least from what I read, the Pennsylvania colonial legislature had specifically instructed delegates to the Second Continental Congress not just to not be in favor of independence, but to actively oppose those efforts. So, uh, you know, while everyone's debating and making their uh, views known in the taverns and out in the streets and public squares and things like that, Franklin just kept his mouth shut, at least at first. And here from Smithsonian again, they say many of the younger, hotter tempered delegates had never witnessed Franklin's artifice of silence, his trick of seeming sage by saying nothing. As the Pennsylvania delegate William Bradford confided, confided to a young James Madison, some of the other delegates had begun, quote, to entertain a great suspicion that Dr. Franklin came rather as a spy than as a friend and that he means to discover our weak side and make peace with the ministers. So they thought he was a royalist, or he might be, and they were very concerned about this. But in fact, they write, Franklin was biding his time through much of May because there were two people both close to him whom he wanted to first convert to the American rebel cause. One was James Galloway, who was a longtime member of the Pennsylvania Assembly but had left public life, and the other was much closer to him, his 44-year-old son, William, who was the governor of New Jersey. So he wanted to get these guys on his side. He did do that. Uh, but then on July 5th, we have the Olive Branch petition. July 6th, we know Jefferson and John Dickinson had drafted in the Continental Congress, had approved the declaration of the causes, why they were taking up arms, why they were fighting. And we will not give up our arms here. They had a gun control program, basically lay down your arms and everyone will get a pardon except Samuel Adams and John Hancock. Give up your guns, give up your friends and we won't kill you was really the message. And that's how I like to say it. And they said, no way. But anyways, on July 5th, the same day that Franklin signed the Olive Branch petition, which blamed Britain's irksome and delusive ministers for the troubles and beseeched the king to come to America's rescue. They were basically taking the position. This is very much heavily influenced by John Dickinson as well taking the position who oh, is fascinating the next day he helped draft or he they you know what they had passed over time he had draft this declaration of causes for taking up arms but at the same time saying oh please oh great king come and protect us from these terrible ministers who are working for you so they were still trying to get some level of reconciliation so this is the day July 5th that Franklin finally made his views public. He certainly was not a spy, and in a letter to his longtime London friend and fellow printer William Strahan, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, but he wrote in cold and calculated fury. Again, this is just shortly after uh, Lexington and Concord and Charleston, all kinds of nasty stuff going on. He said, you are a member of parliament and one of that majority which has doomed my country to destruction. You have begun to burn our towns and murder our people. <laughs> That's not what you hear in most situations when it comes to talking about a government action to preserve safety of the people, right? You're murdering our people. Look upon your hands, he said to his friend. They are stained with the blood of your relations. You and I were long friends. You are now my enemy and I am yours, Benjamin Franklin. Now, interestingly enough, this may have just been... <laughs> <laughs> this may have just been to kind of rally people to the cause because he knew what was coming next. And here 
He didn't even send the letter to his friend. He sent another one that said words and arguments are now of no use. All tense of separation. You know, it says we're going to separate, right? We need to separate, but it wasn't as aggressive. He did not send this particular letter, but he leaked it. He let it be circulated so people would know where he was coming from. And so if you think about it, that's July 5th. And then on the 21st, he has his proposed 21st. And it may have been a couple days before that. We know he had been working on a draft for it for some time. But here he read around the 21st of 1775 uh, the first proposal for the Articles of Confederation. It was called, the name The name of the new confederacy in Article 1 says, shall be henceforth, henceforth the United Colonies of North America. Now, if you looked at the image for this episode, it says United States of North America, and I'll get into a little bit as to how that made a change a little bit later on. Article 2, and this is interesting, the United Colonies hereby severally enter into a firm league of friendship with each other, binding themselves and their posterity for their common defense against their enemies, for the security of their liberties and properties, the safety of their persons and families, and their mutual and general welfare. Interesting, general welfare. But it sounds very similar to a Governor Morris's preamble. So it, that didn't come out of nowhere. You see some of that flowery language very similar here in Benjamin Franklin's proposal for Article 2 of the original Articles of Confederation. Now, mind you, this was never taken up for a vote, but I think it, there was some significant influence there. Article 3, and this is very much a Tenth Amendment approach, that each colony shall enjoy and retain as much as, as it may think fit of its own present laws, customs, rights, privileges, and peculiar jurisdictions within its own limits, and may amend its own constitution as shall seem best to its own assembly or convention. This is actually much it's actually a stronger approach than even the Tenth Amendment, which says the power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution or uh, reserved by it. Oh, power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution or reserved by it to the states or the, are reserved to the states or to the people. Wow, am I getting that totally wrong after all these years? I used to be able to just rip this off. The power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution nor prohibited by it to the states are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. Wow, there, I got it. So Benjamin Franklin's was actually much broader. He's basically saying, hey, you can, not just reserving what you haven't delegated, but you can reserve whatever you want. And so each colony can reserve whatever power it wants. And that's what's his proposal for Article 3 of his proposed Articles of Confederation. And just a quick overview again from Smithsonian. They say, under Franklin's proposal, the Congress would have only a single chamber in which there would be proportional representation from each state based on population. We can see some influence there as well. Franklin also proposed that instead of a president, the Congress would appoint a 12-person executive council whose members would have served for staggered three-year term, three terms. Now, as Franklin realized, and this is why, if you think why he was keeping it quiet and wanted to get people on board, in July of 1775, to create a new confederation of the colonies in that scenario while fighting was going on, this was really a declaration of independence. And that's how they put it at Smithsonian. They said this pretty much amounted to a declaration of independence from Britain and a declaration of dependence by the colonies on each other. And so Meharry puts it this way. Now, he had uh, circulated some drafts of this, and I'm going to get to Thomas Jefferson here in just a moment. Uh, Mike writes that Franklin showed the, the copy of this to several members of Congress, including Thomas Jefferson. The reaction was mixed. Now, mind you, July 5th, 75, there, I mean, there's already plenty of fighting. There's burning and murder happening. But they're sending off the Olive Branch petition, begging the king to save them from Parliament and what's going on. July 6th, they're saying, we're not going to lay down our arms, Thomas Gage. We're going to keep fighting until all danger has been removed and will never come back. So that was a pretty significant line in the sand. In other words, this is not ending anytime soon. So the timing, Mike writes, was the biggest issue in the summer of 75. Many people still hoped for reconciliation with Britain. Voting on or even debating Articles of Confederation would take a definitive step towards independence and ratchet up an ongoing debate 
a lot of members weren't ready to have publicly. So the plan for from Benjamin Franklin basically appealed to those who had abandoned hope of reconciliation, people who wanted independence, independence now, not independence later. It kind of antagonized, from my understanding, some of the people who were not ready, and others were just say like, oh, no, nah, this, not, not yet. Let's see how this olive branch petition plays out. So what he did is he read them in Congress, and whether he made the motion or someone else did, uh, they were tabled. And this was a parliamentary maneuver, so he could at least make the presentation get the ball rolling, start pushing for independence, and then not have it in the uh, public record. And that's why I think we don't even know the exact date it was presented to Congress. We think it was the 21st. Now, where did his ideas for this come from? And I think there's a lot of interesting background. I only want to briefly cover this. And here from the National Archives, they say, where did they come from? Where are these ideas? A natural assumption would be that he uh, quarried them Is that how they put it? He quarried them from the Albany plan, altered to fit the new circumstances. And to some extent, he did. But his principal source, it was argued years ago, was the New England Confederation of 1643, which some of his earlier hints represented as well. And hopefully this will make sense in a moment. Here from Bill of Rights Institute, they said that Franklin had first proposed an idea of an intercolonial government back in 1751, before he had left to go back to London before the Pennsylvania legislature sent him there to basically be their representative in or their agent in London. So he proposed an intercolonial government in 1751, and a month before the Albany Congress convened in 54, he had published his famous Join or Die cartoon in the Pennsylvania Gazette. The political cartoon showed a snake cut into several pieces, which Franklin used to warn readers about the dangers of division in the face of the French encroachments on British claims to the Ohio Valley. So this was, uh, you know, he was taking the British side at that point. I'm wearing the shirt. Uh, If you're looking up on the screen here, you can see the join or die uh, cartoon as well. I think years later, he didn't like how it was being used to represent things, but this certainly was his argument at that point. And then he also had, in 1754, as a delegate to the Albany Congress, Before the conference, he wrote a series of notes. They were called Short Hints Towards a Scheme for Uniting the Northern Colonies. These notes, Mike writes, served, this is Mike Meharry's article, served as a starting point for that Albany plan. And although they use the term colony in the plan later on in this Articles of Confederation, he used the term colonies. In the plan, in practice, each would operate as an independent state. Significantly, the proposed confederation years later maintained the sovereignty of each colony. Of course, if they can actually reserve whatever power they choose, that's far more sovereignty of the people of the states or of the colonies under that plan, under Benjamin Franklin, who is probably more of a big government guy than a lot of the people that we talk about and think were were the best kind of federalist or anti, well, it depends on what term of art you want to use, the, more, the better supporters of federalism during ratification, this idea idea that each colony or each state would be able to retain whatever it decided is certainly holding a lot more sovereignty closer to home. Significantly, Mike writes, the proposed confederation maintained the sovereignty of each colony. Under the plan, the federal Congress was authorized to settle intercolonial disputes, create new colonies, and admit other established colonies into the Union. The general government would also be empowered to negotiate with native tribes. I think he said six of them make war and peace and form alliances, but it was rejected. Now, mind you, this. Uh, now, if we go back to the Albany plan, they had these ideas that they built upon for the Articles of Confederation. I'm sorry to go back and forth from 1754 uh, to 1775, but I think it all kind of ties together. Now, Franklin himself doesn't really kind of connect it all the way that I think we do this, see this kind of lineage, and he never really claimed that the Albany plan was his precursor, but certainly you can see how he was working on this kind of stuff and how it played out later. So again, the Bill of Rights Institute, they say, when the delegates carried the plan back to their home governments, they found their efforts greeted mostly by indifference or hostility, even though this was a plan to unite the colonies to fight off the French for the British, well, for the mother country, it was still seen as hostility because if they could create their own union, maybe there's a problem here. So it looks like the British 
were actually onto something very early on, much earlier than the notion of uh, the beginning of the controversy, as John Adams put it, between the colonies and Great Britain, which started, to, according to him, in 1761 with James Otis Jr. and his arguments against the writs of assistance, or 1764 and 1765, the preparation for and uh, passing of the Stamp Act, which Jefferson considered the beginning of the revolution. So they say when the delegates carried it back, it was met mostly by indifference or hostility. None of the colonial assemblies endorsed it. The king's ministers dismissed it as a threat to royal powers in colonial affairs. So even if they liked the notion, they're basically saying, well, we don't want you being in charge of something like this. If they were going to have a union, they would probably say, you're going to have a union whether you want it or not. And this is who's going to be in charge of it. And these are the rules you're going to follow. You don't get to retain what you want. That's that kind of have your own choice in your own area was not a British approach, especially in the colonies. And they go further, they say, despite his presence in the Continental Congress and Constitutional Convention, Franklin himself never explicitly linked the Articles of Confederation or the Constitution to the Albany Plan. Rather, in his autobiography, he postulated that had the Albany Plan been adopted in 1754, it might have very well prevented the crisis that drove the colonies and Britain apart a generation later. I don't understand that concept. I'm going to have to kind of dig into it. I've actually not read his autobiography, so I don't know why. But if you're interested in the hints as to why, that's that's your breadcrumb. We all got to learn on this one together. But if someone actually has some insight as to that, as to why he thought that would have prevented it, um, then I would love to actually learn a little bit about that. Anyways, back to Franklin's articles. We know he circulated them. He handed them to Thomas Jefferson, a bunch of other people. And of the plan, this is how Jefferson described it years later in 1786. Quote, I was absent from Congress from the beginning of January 76 to the middle of May. Either just before I left Congress or immediately on my return, I rather think it was the former, Dr. Franklin put into my hands the draft of a plan of confederation, desiring me to read it and tell him what I thought of it. I approved it highly. So Benjamin Franklin was kind of solicit, working the, the halls, trying to find other members to see who was in support and who was opposed. I think he was ready to have a Declaration of Independence right there in June of 17 or July of 1775. He had may have been ready already in April or as soon as he convinced his son in New Jersey and his friend from Pennsylvania to get on board. Maybe he was ready at that point, but there weren't enough people to make it unanimous. And even when he was he took this approach regularly throughout his career. Even on that last day of the Philadelphia Convention, the reason he was saying, I approve this with all its faults, those of you who don't think it's awesome, you know, I agree. It's going to end in despotism, but let's get the ball rolling because we need to do something today. And, you know, we'll have some good people in charge for a certain number of, number of years, and then it's up to the next generation to deal with it. And yeah, the next generation didn't do a good job. But he was basically trying to shop this around, and Jefferson was very much in favor of it. He liked it. He made a bunch of notes, and uh, there's actually copies of it. And I will link to these with all of Jefferson's notes as well what he thought of it. So he looked at it, he put some insight and uh, etc. on it, and he added a bunch of observations. He offered an amendment. And Jefferson, I think, is the guy who actually crossed out the word colonies in Franklin's original and started writing states. So if you, again, the image for this episode on our homepage, on all the video platforms, uh, on Apple Podcasts, I appreciate all the reviews that have been coming in there. Thank you very much you'll see the United States rather than United Colonies, and I think that was Jefferson's doing or maybe a group of people. And then here he wrote, question, their mutual general and welfare, what does that mean? There should be no vague, no, it said, question what their mutual and general welfare means, because that was one of the things that Benjamin Franklin put in there. You know, they can take care of their general welfare. And Jefferson said there should be no vague terms in an instrument of this kind. Its objects should be precisely and determinatively fixed. So the term general welfare was a legal term that we understood or was explained by the legal minds of rat during ratification. 
But the Anti-Federalists regularly said, we know what you're telling us this means. We know what it's saying in the, in the law books. But how is this going to play out in practice? General welfare is a phrase that the Anti-Federalists repeatedly warned about during the ratification debates would be read in a way that would expand power by people who wanted to expand power because you can't trust people to keep power limited. It's human nature. And we know that Thomas Jefferson, who was neither Federalist nor Anti-Federalist, even at the time of 1775, Benjamin Franklin's first proposal for the Articles of Confederation more than a decade before ratification of the Constitution is saying, look, what's this? What are we doing with this general welfare phrase? We don't want to have anything that can be misconstrued. So that was one of his notes, and he did not actually like that one. Then he had an amendment about expansion of lands. I highlighted here. I'm not going to read it because it's just a... <laughs> It's a bunch, but uh, you can read through this. I will link to it in the show notes as well. And then on the last, very last page, he added three paragraphs with the heading additions. The first of these reads, quote, No colony shall keep any standing forces without consent of general Congress or the colonies bordering on it. So they couldn't keep any. This is a standing army argument. They can have them if everyone's in agreement. But the general, it's basically a prohibition and then get permission if you read them. So he had three editions. The first one was that about standing army, standing forces. The second one was his notes about the general welfare term. And then the third was about the number of representatives. And then here in Article 5, we can see the powers of Congress. I'm not going to read them in full, but I've got here in my notes, basically determine war or peace, send and receive ambassadors. This is all the powers of Congress. This is it. Enter into alliances, settle disputes between colonies, make ordinances for the general welfare, which Jefferson wanted to clarify, general commerce to establish a currency, and establishment of posts, post roads, were basically interstate highways of today that were marked by posts, mile markers, and then the regulation of the arms, armed forces. And that was the limit of the powers of Congress. And then in Article 10, they say, no colony shall engage in offensive war with any nation of Indians without the consent of Congress, trying to prevent conflict there. And Article 12 was the amendment process. Anyways, it was set aside. It never got a vote, but it certainly got the ball rolling, not only for what became the Articles of Confederation and then the Constitution itself, the Constitution of the United States, the second Constitution, that is, but it also got the ball rolling on independence because creating a plan of confederation in and of itself would have been seen as a declaration of independence. Now, in the fall, Silas Dean and I think some others from Connecticut had their own draft that I think expanded on this one. Then in January of 1776, Thomas Paine published Common Sense, which railed against uh, the, the king, against the British system. And he also made suggestions. Thomas Paine had his own proposal for a continental charter, basically like an American Magna, Char Magna Carta in Common Sense. Then on June 7, 1776, Following instructions from Virginia's Fifth Revolutionary Convention, I'm reading this here, Richard Henry Lee introduced a resolution in the Second Continental Congress to A, declare independence, B, a call to form alliances, and C, a plan for confederation. So here at this point, it was 11 months later, almost a full 11 months later before the full Second Continental Congress was ready to put together this plan for confederation, but Benjamin Franklin certainly got things rolling. Now, if you're interested in all these other things that happened along the way, maybe I can cover Silas Dean, the Connecticut proposal. I'm not sure if there's too much to cover there, but I think uh, Thomas Paine's plan in Common Sense, it's short. That could be an interesting Fast Friday episode. I've got an episode here up on the screen talking about the Lee resolution of uh, that called for independence foreign alliances, and a plan for confederation. I will link to that episode, Totally Dissolved, the Lee Resolution and Independence. I will link to that in the show notes. And then, of course, we have John Dickinson's first draft of what started the debate 
over the Articles of Confederation before it was finally ratified on July 12, 1776. I will certainly cover that one at some point, especially if you guys want to hear more about these Articles of Confederation as well. And here from Meharry, he said, some of Franklin's proposals were adopted into that first draft by John Dickinson, including a common treasury and an executive council. Other ideas were not included, such as a formal amendment process and proportional representation in Congress. Well, you know, like I said right at the beginning, understanding some of these precursors, this might be some dry history and some dates and stuff like that, but understanding where this stuff came from is so important. So many times during the ratification debates, they talk about something that happened in that confederation period. And if you don't understand how that played out or the law under the Articles of Confederation, you can't understand the motivation or the debate that was happening over the ratification of the Constitution. So if you guys are really interested in this, I will continue doing more. I'm definitely going to do a few more episodes on this in the coming year or so. Uh, but there's nothing that helps us get this kind of foundational information out to more and more people every single day than the financial faith and support of our members. No pressure on this at all. We've been doing this episode, this show, for four-plus years now. We've got over 10,000 articles and blogs and podcasts on our website. We will continue to make that available for free. But if you can pitch in as little as 2 bucks a month over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members, I would be extremely grateful for any support you can give us today. I'm going to take a look over in the live chat and see if there's any comments or questions and see if there's anything I can get back to. Samuel says, great show, Michael. I appreciate that. Uh, Richard Henry Lee resolution of July 2nd, Haji said was key. It was actually following those instructions from the, the Congress or the convention in Virginia. And it started in June and then they finally got the approval in July 2nd. I appreciate your feedback, Haji. Thank you so much. Uh, see if there's anything else. Remember to share this on social media as well. Yeah. The more that you spread the word, the more that people end up hearing about the show, they find whether it's these longer episodes or a Fast Friday one that tends to be about 15 minutes or so for people who like shorter versions. And then we're doing, Mike Meharry does three, four times a week, and I do them every one or two weeks, just a short one-minute video on foundational principles. So the more that we can get information out to people in ways they like it, whether it's long form, whether it's shorter or it's just a minute, whether it's articles or shorter blog posts, we have white papers like our State of the Nullification Movement Report. We try to do as many different versions of content that people may be interested in. Very few are interested in all of it, but I hope you are, of course. Uh, take a look and see if there's any further questions. The government is too big and too evasive. Absolutely. In today's world, we can no longer turn to the media for backup. There is now a monopoly. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're all victims, really, if you think about it. We're all victims of government-run education. So, so many people that I've talked to, especially reporters, and I kind of, Mike Meharry is a, a professionally trained journalist. So I know he came over to our side. He learned. I came from uh, government-run schools. We've all been propagandized from birth to the to death, really. I mean, we're in an age of information where information is available. So it does take a little bit of laziness to not try to find this, this kind of history. Uh, but people who are interested will search it out. Now, I do have a kind of... I feel bad sometimes for people in the media because I talk to them and... You know, even when they try to actually present a fair story, some of the frontline reporters, they'll send me oftentimes after an interview, they'll say, hey, this is how uh, you answered this question. Is this a fair representation? I've had this from major media places, New York Times, for example. And when it gets finally gets to the editorial level, the higher level, they chop it up or they twist it around. So some of these people actually try to do a good job. Uh, maybe they're just uh, not part of the problem yet, but they certainly were propagandized. They don't even they've never even heard of this type of stuff ever. So the notion that someone might have a different view than what they've been told left and right is just crazy to them sometimes. Let me take a look. Uh, Clay Kent says, Benjamin Franklin was totally right. All governments turn into despotism eventually. It will end in despotism. That was September 17th, 1787. Again, I will take a look over in the chat a little bit later today. You can also email me at team at 10thamendmentcenter.com. All spelled out. Don't forget to consider joining us as a member. Two bucks a month over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. Leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, smashing the like button, sharing comments, all those things help us spread the word. I really appreciate you being here. I hope you had an awesome weekend. I hope your week is off to a good start. And I'll see you next time here on the Path to Liberty.